Good afternoon, everybody. Big welcome to the Royal Voluntary Service today. I'm here to teach you a bit about sign language and uh, various things. So back in April and May and June, I had done some sign language training. And every week we had a different theme or a different topic. And I have to say, I really enjoy teaching you all at that time. Today is going to be slightly different, less of an emphasis on sign language and more of an emphasis on how and why deaf people work with interpreters. So I will go into that a bit later and that's what's coming up today. First of all, I do hope everybody's well. I hope you've had a great summer. I am from and living here in Northern Ireland. I'm in Belfast at the moment. And I have to say, we had some great weather this summer, possibly the best summer we've had in quite a long time. It was properly hot, properly hot. In Belfast, we actually got up to 30 degrees. And for Northern Ireland, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. But I hope you had some sun wherever you went. And if you got away, I hope you enjoyed that too. Obviously, it's been a tough couple of years. Uh, we had been in lockdown just for four months previous to this summer. So I hope you all did enjoy your summer and you did something nice wherever you were. Um, yes, yeah, so I we actually did. My family got to go down to Kerry in the south of Ireland. And it's very far south, very far south and west. I know Ireland's very small compared to England and Scotland. But for us, that was a bit of a long journey. From Belfast, we're at the very north, and then we had to go a good five-hour drive down to Kerry, but it was absolutely worth it. Absolutely beautiful. First time we've been down there as a family, so it was fantastic, and we were lucky with the weather too. So I have to say it went very, very well. We just went there at the right time, and we got to Kerry. was amazed at just how beautiful it was. I have to say it was maybe the most beautiful place in Ireland that I've been, and I've been all over Ireland, but it was, I have to say, it was stunning. We're lucky we got away. The views were stunning. They were spectacular. So if you're ever in Ireland, head to Kerry. Okay. So I just want to give you an idea of the plan for this afternoon. I'm going to start off with some deaf awareness. And I'm going to ask you a few questions, maybe a max of five questions. And I want you to write down yourself if you're with somebody or you're somebody's in your house a family member that just say what you think or you can comment what you think after that i'm going to talk to you about interpreters who they are what they are and why and how deaf people work with them because for deaf people who are sign language users interpreters are an integral part of our lives okay so i'm going to just teach a few signs just to get us started just in case any of you have forgotten the signs that we did last term or in case some of you are joining for the first time. So hello is just like this, a wave. And how are you is like this. How are you? And if you're asked how you are by a deaf person, you respond like this. You point to yourself. So I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. That's the sign for thank you. So I'm good. Thank you. I'm happy. It's a sign for happy. I'm happy. That's our sign for happy. Or I'm stressed. In case you're stressed today, that's a sign for stressed. And this morning, I have to say, I got a bit stressed. A bit stressed with work this morning. It was a busy old morning. But now I'm nice and relaxed. Thank goodness. And I'm really excited to be here with you all teaching you sign language on this live this afternoon. Okay. So let's do that again. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm happy. I'm stressed. 
Well done. Well done, everybody who joined in there. OK. I'm going to ask you a question. And this is a question related to deaf awareness. So maybe you have already met a deaf person. Maybe you know some deaf people. Or maybe you've never met a deaf person. And that's why this is really useful to check in here just to learn a bit about that. So I want to ask you, what do you think deaf people's lives are like? Be it their job opportunities, their education, how they mix with family. What are your preconceptions about how deaf people live and function? Do you have any at all? So as I said, you can write down the question to help you remember the question. Just have a few thoughts about that. And I will repeat the question again, just as you think there. So what do you imagine deaf people's lives to be like? What do you think life is like as a deaf person in work, their job opportunities, what it's like to be deaf and go to school or go to uni? What's it like how they, how they are with their family? What they're like with friends? Do they do sport? Those sorts of things. Any ideas, you can comment in the comment boxes. I have another question before I answer that one. Do you think that, obviously, as I mentioned, I use British Sign Language. And do you think then the world uses the same language? Every country in the world has their own language or do you think every country in the world pretty much uses the same or very similar language? So I will repeat that again. Do you think sign language is universal? Is it the same in every country or similar? Or do you think it's quite different? Another question, question three. So you've all heard of IQ, obviously, measuring a person's intelligence. Do you think deaf people have a lower IQ than people who aren't deaf? Are they born with a lower IQ than people who aren't deaf? So I'll ask that again. Do you think that deaf people do naturally have a lower IQ compared to the rest of society? Very good. Question four. Do you think sign language is quite a limited language compared to the way you can express in spoken languages like French or English? Do you think sign language is a bit lesser or more limited than those spoken languages? going to ask you that again. So this is question four. Do you think that sign language is slightly less of a language compared to spoken languages that maybe can express more? Do you think sign language is slightly more limited? And the last question. When it comes to deaf people working with interpreters, would you see those interpreters as people who help deaf people? So the interpreter will go along, they will speak on behalf of the deaf person and they will help that deaf person to achieve whatever needs to be achieved in their interaction. Now, my challenge is trying to remember those five questions I've just asked you. <laughs> 
Okay. But I will just repeat question five. Do you think if you see a deaf person and a hearing person and they're using an interpreter, do you think that interpreter's there sorting everything out, helping the deaf person make sure everybody understands what's being said? Excellent. So I've just asked you five questions there. Okay. Okay. So what I would love is if there's any but any comments on any of those questions what whatsoever, I'd love if you could comment in the comments box. What about question one? Has anybody any thoughts whatsoever on question one? So while hopefully some people are typing or giving a few ideas, I'm going to just give you a few points. And I'm going to talk a little bit about deaf people and interpreters. And that should give us time to, to read some of the comments that will hopefully come through. And so I suppose uh, the thing about this workshop is that we're online. Everything's kind of gone online. So what way I think we should work it today is I had those five questions that I've asked you. As you type some answers or some thoughts to question one, I will give you a bit of an idea as to how deaf people do work with interpreters. And then we will split this up and we'll go through the questions and we'll work it like that. OK, so the, the theme of this is how we work with interpreters. So rather than me standing here waiting for comments, I'll just start to give you some information as we go along. OK, so people who are deaf have a choice. So we will choose whether we want to have an interpreter present or not. And that's important that you understand this whole idea of choice. Deaf people have different levels of hearing. Not all deaf people are the same. And I did give some information about this back in April and May. And I do want to go over this again because it is important. So deaf people are usually born either profoundly deaf or with some sort of hearing loss. Just because you're deaf doesn't mean you can't hear. There are lots of people who, despite having some hearing loss, can hear pretty well and therefore will develop language just as a person who isn't deaf would because they can hear enough to acquire spoken language. There are other people who are profoundly deaf who can't hear anything and as a result then can't really acquire spoken language and find it difficult to produce language. And that's why then a lot of deaf people's uh, spoken language may not seem clear because they've never heard the language. So those who have some hearing and can hear quite well will be able to communicate themselves and they'll be able to use speech to communicate and therefore won't need an interpreter. And very often what you will see is people who maybe are in the workplace in any sort of meeting or that, wherever they're working, very often they will realise that despite they can hear quite well, they will still use an interpreter. They will still use an interpreter in that situation where it's a group environment or people are talking over each other. And there's a lot of background noise. And that's why you'll see an interpreter brought into specific situations for people who may also speak and hear well. Some will be able to cope OK with technology, but some may use an interpreter. Very often people who have some sort of hearing loss at birth, that will degenerate as they get older. And very often you'll see people as they get older, then start to use interpreters more. Just to give them full access as to what's going on, not only the, the main speaker say, but the chit chat and everything that's going on around them. Because very often a bit of chit chat holds a lot of information that's crucial and key. So it's important that deaf people have access to everything. Now, there are people who are sign language users and they don't use speech, they can't hear, and therefore they will use an interpreter a lot more because they need to make sure they know what's going on around them and they'll use an interpreter a lot. And so therefore, you'll understand why there's different levels of deafness which lead on to different communication choices 
And that's why choice is very often important. And it's important to ask the person what their preferred method of communication is. Yeah, I'm just reading the comments there. Yep, OK. So those of us who do work with interpreters, it's not the easiest process. It's something that takes practice. We will always encourage that people use a fully qualified interpreter. And I'm going to explain just detail what an interpreter is. We know that there's spoken language interpreters or sign language interpreters. We have interpreters that go from French to English, Spanish to French. And an interpreter's job is to translate between two languages. So the interpreter's role then is to interpret between the languages. But also what's important is that for deaf people, we are in different workplaces. We're also attending different places. It could be hospital. It could be court. We could be joining a, a sporting team. We could be in school. We could be in church. So interpreters go to all these different domains and provide interpreting in all of these. And therefore, interpreters are very much portfolio interpreters. So they're working across a variety of domains. And as a result, they need to make sure before they go into a booking, they're prepared adequately and they know what to expect. Especially if meeting is extremely important. Maybe it is a deaf person's end responsibility to prep their interpreter to make sure the interpreter knows what's going on, to make sure they know what has happened before this meeting, know what the outcome, preferred outcomes are. All of this detail is very important for a successful appointment. So deaf people are constantly thinking about their interpreters. So most people go into work, they just get on with their work, they do what they need to do. But for deaf people, there's that added thing where we need to understand that to get what we need and to do our jobs, we need to be working very effectively with our interpreters. Now, let's just go back to our deaf awareness. First of all, is sign language international? Is it universal, true or false? That is false. It is false. So, like any language spoken, each country will have their own language or at least one language because it comes out of culture. Language comes from a culture and therefore every culture is different and will have its own language. Now, I've been teaching deaf awareness and there have been a few people who say to me, it would make a lot more sense if sign language was international and there was one language for everybody throughout the world. And I'll respond and say, well, yes, absolutely. Why do we not just drop every spoken language and everybody uses one spoken language? It's not practical. People value their language, they need their language, and it's not just as simple as saying, let's scrap all the other languages and use one language. So I'm from Ireland, as, and as I said, I'm based in Northern Ireland, and I'm from Belfast. Obviously, Northern Ireland is part of the UK. So therefore, that's who we are. We're under the UK. We are part of the UK. The majority of sign language users here in Northern Ireland are British sign language users. Now, if we drive south for an hour, we enter the Republic of Ireland. And in the Republic of Ireland, they use a different language. They use Irish sign language, which is completely different from British sign language, completely different. And their language, ISL, has similarities because of its history to French Sign Language, LSFB. So it is completely different and it's quite amazing to look back at the history and to understand that. So here in Northern Ireland, we actually have two official languages, sign languages. We have British Sign Language and Irish Sign Language because we have a very substantial population of Irish Sign Language users up here too. And that is because of education. Very often, a couple of generations ago, a lot of deaf people went to school in um, either the south of Ireland or England or here in Northern Ireland. In Northern Ireland, we have one deaf school and there the language would be British Sign Language users. We had people who then went to school in the south. They went to school in Dublin. They went to boarding school there and obviously picked up Irish Sign Language, but brought it back home whenever they moved back after school. 
So the answer then to that, after all that, is that every country will have at least one language and that sign language. Now let's go back to deaf people working with interpreters. I just want to reiterate again the importance of choice and the fact that interpreters need prep before they go into a job. They can't go in blindly. They need to know what they're going into. And to become an interpreter, you need to be qualified and you need to study. You will do your language courses. And in the UK, we have level one right up to level six. Level six is the equivalent to an undergraduate degree. After an interpreter has done their level six or at the same time, whatever pathway they choose, they will then go on to do interpreter qualifications. It's a postgraduate diploma. And that will be more about learning about ethics, learning about the role of an interpreter, learning about translation. And it's not something that comes quickly. It takes a long time to become a very competent interpreter. And it's the same with any other language. You need to take many years to become competent and fluent in it. Now, we do have some interpreters who grew up using the language because their parents were deaf. And very often they'll maybe not need to start at level one or level two because they already have the language skills they can join a level three course. Likewise, again, with other languages. It's about your experience and your exposure and your use. So when an interpreter does become qualified, they still need to do further training. They will very often shadow qualified interpreters to, uh, to get experience and to get the know-how because it actually is quite a high risk job at times. Interpreters need to be qualified for five years before they start to do court work or medical work. So they need to make sure they've built up their experience in interpreting before they go into these more high risk jobs. So very often they'll start off doing a lot of community interpreting. They'll work in education. They'll work in, in jobs that don't have such high risk. And then when they build up their experience, and their expertise, they'll be able to go into these other domains like court and police and uh, medical. And it is a tough job. It is a tough job because of the level of processing required to work between two languages, but also two modalities, visual and spoken languages. So it requires a lot of processing and it requires a very strong memory because an interpreter will always be producing language that they have seen or heard maybe eight or nine seconds ago, but also they're listening to the next bit of language that they need to produce. And also what I should say is that the deaf community have their own culture and it's a very different way. It's a very different culture from that of mainstream society. And that's just the same if you go to any country. This, the culture in Spain and France, they're all very different. So interpreters are not only translating the language, but also the culture. They're cultural mediators as well. And in that sense, they need to have a very good knowledge and understanding of deaf culture to be able to do it to be able to do it effectively, because if you just focus on the language without the culture, it won't be a meaningful translation. Now, it is very interesting. It really is. Just looking at some of the comments here. Yeah, I hope everybody's OK with the technology. And if they're not, I do believe the technology is fine at our end. So hopefully they'll get back on. Yes, I definitely am on live, I do believe. OK. So let's look again at some of our deaf awareness. So do you think sign language is a slightly more limited language than spoken languages? I will answer that for you, and it's not. BSL, French Sign Language, Irish Sign Language, American Sign Language, all the different sign languages of the world are the same. They're absolutely equivalent to spoken languages. We have vocabulary. We have, I mean, this is also why it's it's difficult for the interpreter, because it's not a word for word translation. A lot of our meaning and our grammar and syntax is based in the face and our non-manual features and our facial expressions. So therefore, I may just do a tweak of my face, which may be an entire sentence in English. 
It's not just the hands we look at, it's absolutely everything. It is a language that uses the whole body. Now we have our own grammar, our own structure, we have our own syntax, and it's very different from a spoken language, but it's still equivalent. So as deaf people, we will learn English, but it's a second language for us. It's not just a matter of writing down the signs or signing what you see. It's completely different. And you know, BSL is beautiful because we can't hear. The likes of tone, wordplay, rhyme means nothing to us, but we have all the equivalent, but it's just different. It's done in a visual way as opposed to uh, auditory. So it is hard, I suppose, I'm giving you a lot of information here, but if you do join the course, if you do try and do some introduction with ourselves or you do do a level one, you'll see how beautiful the language is. We have beautiful poets who are deaf and use poetry through sign language. We have beautiful sign songs, deaf people who do those and they're beautiful and they're fantastic. And it's the equivalent of a spoken language. I'm sure you've seen uh, on the news, we have deaf people who are news presenters. We definitely have it here in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales. England don't, strangely enough, which is quite strange that they don't have it, but the uh, other devolved areas do have it. Um, and there's a lot of still campaigning around all of this so that we do get more exposure in mainstream media. As you know, the pandemic broke out last year and in Northern Ireland, the, our, our office brought in, our Northern Ireland executive brought in two interpreters, ISL and BSL, for all of their briefings. Scotland had an interpreter in their briefing and as did Wales, but the, Boris Johnson didn't have, a, have an interpreter. So thankfully that has changed now and all the governments do have interpreters for those briefings because information like that is crucial for deaf people as it is for anybody else. And up in Scotland, there is a BSL Act that has been enacted and passed through Parliament. And we're hoping here in Northern Ireland, we will get the same soon. And I'll go into a bit of that later as well, because it is important information. Now, I just want to go back quickly to the deaf awareness. So question one. Question one was, what do you think deaf people, deaf people's lives are like? Do they work? Where do they work? How do they attend school, college, uni? What are their lives like? I suppose I can answer this. It varies. It varies as does anybody's life. Very often it depends on the family a person's brought up in, their company, all of that. Now, I have to say that I've had a similar experience to a lot of my friends. You will have some deaf people who grew up in a deaf family, so their parents are deaf. You'll have deaf people who grow up in a family where they're the only deaf person. Now, of course, whenever it comes to education, deaf people do have to work harder because the thing is we're very often in a mainstream school. We may need to use an interpreter. It may be the case that a teacher is using some sign language, but they're not fluent. Or it may be the case that you'll have a classroom assistant if you're deaf to do some one-to-one -one work. So all of that means then that deaf people do have to work harder just to keep afloat. And a lot of deaf people and deaf peers will help each other. And also then parents are obviously a very important part of that too. For education, I would always say it's so important to have an interpreter in place if the teacher can't sign fluently. At the moment, it's not the case that this is something that's compulsory. Hopefully one day this is something that there will be provision around where interpreters will be used in the classroom. I uh, went to university and I absolutely insisted on the interpreter of my choice because it's the only way we can really get access. It's the only way we can be on a part of somebody else, uh, be it if you're doing a degree or a HND or anything at all, it's important that you have access. Without access, you can't access the curriculum of choice. And very often there will be funds made available to pay for this provision, for example, interpreters. Within the family, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people who grow up in the deaf family have natural, full communication because everybody's signing together. 
outside of that family unit where somebody enters into society where it's very often surrounded by English is slightly more difficult. A lot of deaf people though are born into families where nobody signs and it's difficult and I did mention this back in April or May but there's a real emphasis on oralism and trying to get deaf people to speak. So very often a family will have a baby and they find out this baby's deaf. They're told by the doctor your baby's deaf and very often the first words that come out of a doctor's mouth are negative. They're negative because they see it as something that's very, very negative. And therefore that, along with the diagnosis, puts parents into an awful state of shock. And very often the recommendation now are make sure your child speaks. Don't sign. It'll affect their ability to use spoken language. And sign language. I mean, in, in the past, back in 1880, sign language is completely forbidden at an education conference and therefore it started this legacy of sign language not being allowed to be used. People thought sign language would affect your spoken language or affect a deaf child's ability to learn English. The last 20 years research has proven that that's not the case. The evidence shows that sign language helps deaf children to be able to speak better, to acquire English better and to go on and get better educational attainment because everybody needs a natural foundation language, especially from zero to five, it's the window of opportunity, those early years where a child needs a foundation language, one that they can access fully, easily, and without difficulty. And that sets them the best way to be able to pick up English as a second language. A lot of children who missed out on language from not to five then do really do struggle with English and their educational attainment. So it is something that is, is still quite a bit of a sensitive or sore point. So on that case then, very often a lot of deaf children, whatever family they go into, they'll be given the opportunity to go to a deaf school. And we don't have many deaf schools. And for example, we only have one deaf university, which is in America, it's in Washington DC, Gallaudet University. But there are many deaf boarding schools throughout England. We have a deaf school here in Northern Ireland. It's not boarding. There's a boarding school in Dublin. And some deaf people will be able to go to mainstream school. Maybe their parents will choose that they will attend a mainstream school. Not all deaf children go to deaf schools. There is the choice of education as well. So basically the summary there is if deaf people have full access to education, whatever their access needs are, they can achieve like anybody else. They can live a life like anybody else. And I suppose that's the same in sports or anywhere. Even for example, if a deaf person goes to the cinema, they can only really go if there's a subtitled showing. They can only go to the theatre on the date that there is an accessible showing. But access is so important. And thankfully, now compared to 20 years ago, the world is so much more accessible for deaf people. BSL was recognised back in 2003. And for me, that's very recent. Whoever's young, they'll probably think that was years and years and years ago. 2003, really, it is, whenever you look at uh, systems, it is a very short time ago. But that recognition of the language has made such a difference. Before 2003, there wouldn't have been provision as such, whereas now there's a lot more provision because the language has been recognized. And that's why we can be here today together. I just want to go back briefly to working with interpreters. Suppose interpreters could be considered as the bridge, a bridge that brings two worlds together. Say myself, I'm a sign language user, I'm deaf. Without an interpreter, I have no access to what's going on around me. But with an interpreter and with that access, I can enter into understanding what's going on around me. So it is like a bridge. So everything they hear, they translate. Everything I sign, they speak to whoever's around me. So the interpreter is making it possible that the hearing and the deaf can have connection, they can work together and they can communicate. But just to be clear, the interpreter's not there to help, to make sure everything's okay, 
to take over, to sort things out, to tell the deaf person what to do, to tell the hearing person what to do. That's not their role. That's the deaf person's role and the person that they're speaking with. The interpreter's there with strict roles and boundaries to make sure that they're being impartial and they're translating, they're doing all that interpreting, but they're not taking the lead. Of course, they're facilitating communication, but they're not helpers. They're not advocates. They're people that are there to make sure that communication is happening. And very often deaf people will say, and we'll discuss this, that the, the, a lot of the people just think the deaf, the interpreter's there as, as, as a spokesperson for the deaf person. And that's not the case whatsoever. Not the case whatsoever. And very often, you know, if I maybe be at a job or that, whenever the interpreter sits down to have a coffee or that, everybody's straight over the interpreter. And it's it's important to say that the interpreter is also human. They are human and that has, they, they have a presence, they have an impact on things. But what's very important is that it's the deaf person that's, that's there. So if it's a job, if it's sport, wherever it is, it's the deaf person that the focus should be on and not the interpreter. And that makes it much more natural. So, of course, people are very welcome to speak to interpreters and that, but just make sure that the focus is always on the deaf person, because that's why the interpreter's there too, and they prefer that. Now, let's see, do they filter conversations? They don't filter. They absolutely don't filter any conversations. There will be the case where they'll mediate whenever it comes to cultural things, but they don't filter. They don't filter because filtering is taking away or adding to the message. They don't do that. They convey the entirety of what's being said. Thank you, Elizabeth. So that's how deaf people work with interpreters. And it's important that deaf people are also taking the working conditions into account. They have to make sure that they're appreciating that the interpreter, the interpreters do get tired because of the level of processing, because it is a heavy, heavy task. And the research has said that the length of time an interpreter can go for where they're providing really high quality interpreting is probably 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, the quality does drop slightly. But depending on the job, depending on the domain, it, it, it can differ. So that just shows you the high level of processing that is going on. And therefore, if I'm ever in a heavy meeting or if I'm ever going for a meeting that's going to go on beyond an hour, I will book two interpreters. It's important we have that. So the interpreters have time to have a break in between, uh, in between signing. And when there's co-workers, the, co the interpreters are very experienced at doing this. They will decide maybe they'll do 20 minutes each, 50 minutes each, and they will work that out themselves. It really is amazing and it works so well. I should also uh, talk about how you pay for interpreters because very often that is a problem. Interpreters are highly qualified. They go through a lot of training and therefore their, their wage reflects that. Very often workplaces panic at the thought of having a deaf person because they think they're going to have to pay. Also, the likes of theatres, if they're bringing interpreters, they're going to have to pay for the service like any other service. And that sometimes can go into difficulties. As I've said, there is there's an act up in Scotland. And therefore, as a result of having this act, deaf people have a legal right to have interpreters at various things that they go to. This is a legal requirement for workplaces, for family, for whatever, whatever, wherever deaf people are going, for events. If it's a festival of that and it's requested, interpreters must be provided. And when you're going into the likes of court or hospital, it's important to bear in mind that what happens in a courtroom is, is high risk for an interpreter. So in Northern Ireland, obviously, we have solicitors and we have counsel, we have barristers. Solicitors will need interpreters because if they have a deaf client, when you go into the court, obviously, then there needs to be different interpreters from the consultation interpreter with the solicitor. Because it's very important to stay impartial that the interpreters are separate so that that deaf person has privilege. If there's a case, maybe, for example, where there was a weapon involved, 
this is just an example of a cultural thing whereby weapon, we don't have really a word for weapon as such. Whenever we're signing, we will use whatever the weapon is, be it a gun or a knife, whatever. So these generic terms don't always translate well in sign language. And it can lead to some things being difficult. And there was actually a case stop because somebody had said uh, the interpreter used the wrong weapon and it went, it just uh, then had to be dropped. Another thing like this here is say, for example, uh, in one questioning, the barrister said, is it right you assaulted the person? The interpreter signed punch, but in actual fact, the assault had been cigarette burns in an arm. What that meant was the deaf person said no, and the whole case then was delayed because because of that then, um, because of that, it looked like there was confusion and difficulty. So very often interpreters need to be aware, which is why I said that they do need to make sure that they are very well qualified and very experienced so that they're not running into problems like this in court because it can be very difficult. So Scotland is definitely leading the way when it comes to having a BSL Act and the deaf people who live up in Scotland will say that they can really see and feel the difference of having that act. Here in Northern Ireland we don't have that yet. And it means then that there are certain areas of our lives where deaf people are still quite disadvantaged. So we're hoping that we will be able to get that back soon. Now, I'm just going to finish off with some deaf awareness about the average IQ of deaf people, that deaf people just are born with a lower IQ than the rest of society. True or false, what do you think? So remember, if you do have any questions of that, please do type them in, in the comments box because we're going to be finishing up quite soon. So if you have any questions at all about anything, feel free to put them in the comments box and uh, I'll happily answer them. But yes, it is false, Elizabeth. Absolutely, it's false. The deaf brain and the hearing brain are exactly the same and they have the ability to learn exactly the same. Sometimes deaf people may not achieve as much and that's because very often they've missed that window of opportunity for language as a baby and a small child. And it's very, very sad. It's very sad that a lot of deaf people do fall behind because they don't have access. They've maybe missed out in language at a, at a younger age or they aren't getting access to the curriculum, for example, via an interpreter or a note taker or a classroom assistant to be able to access the curriculum. And it is the case that a number of deaf, deaf people who are leaving school have the English ability of a nine-year-old and that's just down to access, not being able to access the education system. Okay. So just to sum up, deaf people really do value interpreters. They're, they are our access and the provision we need to access the world around us. Now we do value them uh, and it's fantastic that we have interpreters. Say for example, at the moment, I'm so thankful to have an interpreter so that I am able to do this and I'm able to, to give this message to you all. And we do know that things will always improve and provision will always improve as we move forward. So we have no questions here in the comments box. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And I do hope that you all do have a lovely day. I'll be back in two weeks time. And then I'll be doing sign language and also uh, some more deaf awareness and discuss some more about working with interpreters. Now, remember, uh, if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to answer them. So I'll see you in two weeks and I hope you all have a lovely day and a lovely weekend. Take care, everybody. Thank you so much.